For any new electric vehicle startup coming to market, there are several truths that must generally be acknowledged about that market as a whole. In general, startups which don't pay attention to these truths are often left behind, flailing to try and get their vehicles onto the road. Yet one Oregonian startup, Archimoto, has done the seemingly impossible bring a vehicle to market that goes against most of the industry norms, have a successful IPO. That's in the traditional way, by the way, without the help of any special purpose acquisition company. And today has just announced the purchase of a new facility that is five times bigger than its current Eugene, Oregon headquarters. That production facility will be home to a new production line that will enable Akimoto, which has been producing a small number of vehicles for a year or so, to enter into full-scale mass production and hopefully reduce the sticker price of its two-seat, three-wheeled fun utility vehicle, or FUV for short. And yes, you heard me correctly, three wheels and two seats with optional doors. In usual terms, this is the very type of vehicle to fail before it even reaches production. So how can Akimoto have got to this point? Today, I'm going to try and examine that. And I'm going to try and ask if Akimoto has done something fundamentally different to other companies that's enabled it to get to the point that so many companies haven't. Let's start by looking at some of those unspoken rules or norms that Archimoto seems to have just completely broken and ignored, while others have failed for doing so. First, there's the whole form factor. Most people would never consider buying a replacement for an internal combustion engine vehicle that didn't have four seats, four doors, and a fully enclosed cabin. And yet the Archimoto FUV has none of those. Sure, doors are an optional extra, but you're far more exposed to the elements than you would be in a traditional car. But here's the thing. The Archimoto FUV wasn't built to be a replacement for the car. It was designed to be an alternative option for those who needed to commute short distances to work, who needed to run a quick errand, and who didn't need a massive gas-guzzling SUV to do it in. It may not displace car ownership, but it does displace car use, especially in areas where open-air motoring isn't a problem. That second unwritten rule is one that suggests people won't buy an electric vehicle unless it can do several hundred miles or several hundred kilometers on a single charge, can make use of rapid charging stations, and do those occasional once a year road trips to visit your relatives a couple of states over. The Archimoto FUV comes with a top speed of 75 miles per hour, 120 kilometers per hour. It has a city range of just 100 miles, which is 160 kilometers in ideal situations, and a flat out highway range at near top speed of 32 miles, 51 kilometers, as a worst case scenario. And in case you're confused, I should remind you that the Archimoto uses standard range rating methods for electric motorcycles because it's technically an electric motorcycle, but I will come back to that in a second. Let's talk about rapid charging, that thing that most people want when buying a new EV. The Archimoto FUV doesn't have anything faster than level two charging capabilities. It can refill its battery pack from empty to full in eight hours using a standard US outlet, or four hours using a standard level two charging station. Luggage carrying capability isn't good either. Another expectation that most EV buyers have is that an electric vehicle will have larger luggage capabilities than an ICE vehicle. The FUV doesn't even offer a luggage box as standard. If you want one, it's an optional extra. And if you want larger load carrying capabilities than a few bags of shopping or a small weekend suitcase, you'd have to choose the aptly named Deliverator, a version which does away with a passenger seat in deference to a larger sealed locked storage area. Yet the Akimoto FUV can go places where cars cannot. And while it's registered as a motorcycle, it is somewhere between a motorcycle and a car. It has a roll cage, a foot brake, and handlebars. It has crossover seat belts, something that's very similar to the Renault Twizzies design. And it occupies that same tandem seating arrangement as Renault's urban runabout. But because of that roll cage, the seat belts, and something called enclosed cab regulations in some but not all US states, 
It doesn't require a motorcycle license to drive. A car license is usually enough, nor does it require helmets in many states. And that's an instant appeal to those who don't want to worry about all the safety gear that comes with riding a motorcycle. Although, reminder, some states do require you to wear a helmet. That roll cage, roof and optional extra doors also reduce your exposure to the outside elements. And unlike a motorcycle, where you really need a two-way radio to easily communicate with your passenger, conversations are possible when you've got a passenger in the FUV. So, with all of these rules broken, why exactly is Akimoto still succeeding? At its heart, I think one of the reasons that it's doing so well is its no-nonsense attitude in the EV world. Unlike many startups out there, Akimoto has never been big on promising the moon on a stick. It's not been ostentatious, and it's continued to iterate its design and its technology since the company's founding in 2007. It's kept itself lean, and it's continued to iterate during its early days, and that's meant that it's avoided a lot of the high cash burn that so many startups experience in their first few years of life. A high cash burn which ultimately usually ends the company. With Akimoto, the iterative design process is one that will be familiar to many who work in the software industry. There's almost an agile methodology in the fact that Akimoto has gone through seven distinct designs before settling on the eighth generation design for production. And that's been a constant when I've dealt with the team at Akimoto. The company has remained true to its original core values and its upgraded designs as technology has improved. And while it's been forced to push back plans and delay launches, it has remained, from what I can tell, a small, devoted, engaged team. It's been very clear about its goals and very clear about its technology. It's not focusing on producing a vehicle that's faster or more capable than anything out there. It's focusing on a vehicle which brings the utility benefits of offering a reasonably narrow tracked yet long wheelbase three-wheeler in a 2 plus 1 configuration. Akimoto has also been happy to be brave about its decisions. At one point, it toyed with the idea of a fully enclosed vehicle, the so-called Akimoto Pulse. But doing so added complexity to the design, added weight and cost. And while not everyone likes the handlebar setup of the production FUV, it's allowed the company to simplify its design further and avoid some nasty regulatory stuff related to having steering wheels. Mark Freinmeier, Akimoto's founder, was a game developer before starting up Akimoto, and I think that software development process influence is most certainly as obvious at Akimoto as it is with Tesla and Elon Musk. In the rare conversations and interviews I've had with him, he's more interested in a positive product that actually does what he says it will, not hyperbole, ostentatious claims or self-importance. He's proud of what the team has accomplished. And he's modest. And moreover, like a good leader, and not like many startup CEOs out there, Mark's role seems to include problem solving and cheerleading, delegation, and most importantly, an ability to know what he does and doesn't know, and a willingness to learn and take advisement from others. The fact that Akimoto has brought in Sandy Munro of Munro & Associates to figure out how to iterate its design, how to improve cost effectiveness, and how to prepare for cost effective mass production shows that Akimoto and its leadership knows what it does and doesn't know. In a similar way, Akimoto recently added Galileo Russell of Hyperchange TV to the board of directors of the company. While I personally have some pretty strong feelings about Galileo being on the board of directors of a company, while presumably continuing to comment on the wider industry as a YouTuber, that is personally, I think, a blatant conflict of interest as far as I can see, it again shows that Akimoto is willing to bring in people who feels that it will help expand and grow. And the aforementioned concerns notwithstanding, I think Galileo will be a really good fit to help Akimoto. While we're on the subject of leadership, Mark has operated as the company's CEO since its founding. But in 2019, he was reported to have a salary of about $34,000 per year, which I'm guessing was far less than some of the others working at the firm. Only last week was it shifted upwards to something that would be more appropriate, at least according to most people, with CEO remuneration. And that, by the way, is after the company managed to increase its stock value 
by 721.7% in just one year. Then we have what I think is the trifecta in this little recipe of success. A unique vehicle that serves a tangible yet unique purpose, and a group of purposes for which Akimoto has sought out roles. The Akimoto Deliverator, a vehicle which it has already contracted with DHL to supply, is the perfect last mile delivery solution. It's safer than a motorcycle, can carry more, and is zero emission. In large cities across the US, where range is less of a concern and functionality and running costs are more important, this is the perfect delivery alternative to a small scooter. The same could be said in the pizza delivery business, where Archimoto's Deliverator is large enough to carry a sizable pizza oven to keep pizzas warm. It's easier to jump in and out of than a car, and it can park in places a traditional car can't. Akimoto has worked hard to secure itself partners in the delivery industry, and its same is true with its Rapid Responder, a vehicle that it's tried with the local fire department. Barely wider than a traditional motorcycle, it is perfect to get first responders close to patients and deliver life-saving care before an ambulance or fire truck can arrive. Again, personally, as someone who likes the outdoors, but who has a medical condition where a few extra minutes could literally mean the difference between life and death, well, I'm all for small, compact response vehicles that can get there sooner. But perhaps where Akimoto has captured a niche the best is its use as a holiday tour vehicle in well-known vacation spots. Traditionally, rental companies have offered fleets of scooters or small, two-seat, two-stroke cars to holidaymakers looking to sightsee while on holiday. Just like the Renault Twizy rental services we've seen in Europe, parts of Japan, and parts of North America. The Akimoto is reasonably intuitive to learn to use, has more safety features than a two-wheeler, but doesn't require a whole lot of extra space to accommodate in a fleet setting. It already has a limited fleet of hireable FUVs operating in both Florida and New York. And while it's maybe not everyone's cup of tea as a daily driver, for reasons I've already covered, it's just different enough for people to want to hire when they're on vacation, on a whim, and then discover it's more capable and more powerful and more fun than they thought. Akimoto says it envisages a future where its FUV and its derivatives could even have autonomous capabilities. But I'm not sure if I buy that because part of the issue with autonomous driving hardware right now is weight, cost, and complexity. And to be honest, the FUV's current price point, around 17,000 US dollars, needs to drop significantly in order for the vehicle to really take off, which is, by the way, why Sandy Munro is helping Archimoto build a new facility for mass production. Added more complicated hardware right now for autonomous driving, I would fear add unnecessary complexity. Ultimately, Akimoto seems to have executed in the perfect way. It's held enough support from its die-hard fans, some of which helped the crowdfunding of the company's first production run, rolled out its initial first edition vehicles, and then used support from those early customers to refine and improve later models. It was even able to go through an IPO without going through any of those crazy reverse mergers. Its CEO is grounded and not prone to flights of fancy or over-the-top claims, which is something that some other startups really should try and emulate. I just hope it can scale, but that is a completely different challenge. So far, it has defied the auto industry odds. I want you to tell me below if you think it will continue to do the same thing. That's it for today. As always, thanks to the folks on my right for being our $15 to $49 a month Patreon supporters. Special thanks to our $50 a month Patreons, that's John Lyons, Ray Jean Fellows, Jeffrey Songster, Anonymous Freak, Paul Conway, Laura Sandborn, Anthony Coates, and Tesla in the Gong. And our deepest gratitude to our $100 a month Patreon supporters, that's Marcel Ward, Reggie Watts, JP Fagerback, Sean Ueda, Will Graylin, and Ian. You can join all of these amazing Patreon supporters by following the links below, or you can send us a donation through Ko-fi or Bitcoin. You'll also find a link to our free Discord server, so sign up and come and join in the fun. And if you're in need of some swag, please do check our merch store over at Redbubble. After the names are finished scrolling, you'll see a new suggestion for a video to watch, so please consider watching it if you haven't, and I'll be back very soon. Thanks for joining me, and as always, keep evolving!